Well, hello, welcome to this session on cybersecurity. My name is Matt Ross. I'm a contributing editor at Global Government Forum. The organizers of this event, I'm a journalist, been watching the operation of governments around the world for the last 20 odd years. I also, as my accent gives away a Brit, and that means my French is like basic schoolboy. But uh, you're welcome to put questions to the panel in French, and uh, certainly they'll be able to respond to you in French when we come to that point. Um, got some really good panellists with, I think, quite contrasting viewpoints today. It should make for an interesting discussion. We will try to save as much time uh, at the end for questions and interaction with the audience as possible. Um, so the initial comments will be quite brief, but yeah, really good to hear from. To my, my immediate left, Simon Llewellyn. He's Director for Security Architecture at the Canadian Cyber Security Centre and accomplished bartender. Nadine uh, Boudreau Brown, Director General for IT Transformation and Modernization Services at Agriculture and Agri Food Canada. Owen Lam, a cybersecurity specialist and sales engineer lead with our knowledge partner Rubric. Um, so, yeah, we want to have a look at some of the, the ever increasing cyber threats, which cover a huge range from ransomware to data thefts, espionage, and dis disinformation, too and ask how you know, staff at every level and every organisation, every role, can play their part in protecting the public services. Um, perhaps first, Simon. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, I think I'd like to start, um, first of all, a bit, little bit about myself. So I've been with the Canadian Centre for Cybersecurity for four or five years now. Uh, my first instance with them was in the threat assessment uh, piece, so working on cyber threat actors and what they're doing both in the government context uh, as well as Canadian, uh, what's happening in the Canadian citizen space. And then I pivoted to do a little bit of defensive cyber operation planning, so if there's any question there and we can talk to it. And my most recent role as security architect or director of, it's a very narrow title because the team actually does the advice and guidance piece on a number of technologies that the Government of Canada is trying to implement. Uh, we touch on cloud, we touch on everything that you can possibly think of in that new space, think AI, think MFA, think uh, a whole bunch of new technologies coming on. But what I'd like to start with is just kind of setting the tone because the topic is, you know, we are public servants. What are we supposed to do in this emerging space? Am I terrified? Am I good to go? Do I care or I don't care? So let me just start with the threat landscape. I think everybody's been through the pandemic, just like everyone else, we know the storyline. We were in work, we were doing our, our, our duty, if you will, our business in work. Pandemic hit, everybody's at home. So that whole situation changed the threat landscape, not only for us to enable our, our public servants to do the business and carry on delivering services, but it opened up a number of threat vectors for our adversary as well, all right? A couple of stats on the bottom, even today, people don't necessarily wanna go back to work. Well, they want to work, but they want that ability to work in a hybrid environment. And you can see 23% of folks today won't even entertain a job that is not hybrid in nature. 64% of folks right now are never going to unplug, and they're open and admitted about it. I'm going to be online, I'm digital, and that's the way of the future. And of course, most of our medical services now are being offered online, and that's been spoken about a lot today. Services online making them available for everyone. Well, those services, those threat vectors are also available to our threat, act or threat actors who are looking to take advantage of us. National Cyber Threat Assessment, all right? I think most of us have seen this or have heard of it. Key judgments, of course, ransomware is at the top of the list, all right? If you haven't or you don't know about ransomware, I encourage you to have a quick read of the NCTA. Attacks on critical infrastructure, that's becoming more and more apparent. Pipeline attack, we've seen some of that happen. State-sponsored threats, of course. Foreign intelligence, I think we've all seen that happen in the news. Influence campaigns, you know, as I just mentioned, as you're bringing on these new technologies, AI and, and whatnot, these new technologies are also used by our adversaries, if you will, to influence us. And of course, at the bottom, those disruptive technologies, as I mentioned. So what, what's relevant to us, if you will? And I'll come back to that influence campaigns. When I first joined the Cyber Center, 
we were putting out cyber defense reports and, and whatnot, and we would get reports in on how threat actors were sending you know, nefarious emails to folks and whatnot, and I'll, I'll touch a little bit on that in a minute because I think social engineering is the key piece here. And we would see these, these emails come in or these threat vectors, and you could really like, oh my God, you know, if anybody falls for this email, the, it's ridiculous. The spelling was off, the context was off. Now you flip it to today, and I've got AI writing that email to you or to you or to you, you're going, oh, is this real or is it not? Because it makes sense, it's coherent, it's well-written, and it looks like it came from somebody I know, all right? So just a little bit of, it's actually gonna build, which is kinda cool. So everybody's heard of phishing, right? Right? Any, what, what else is out there? Anything? How about spear phishing? You're getting a little bit more pointed. So I'm not just broadly phishing now, I'm focusing on an individual, all right? How about whaling? Anybody heard of that term? Going after the big fish, all right, the big one. How about smishing? You get text message coming in, right? So now our adversaries are also using our lovely mobile device to try and get our attention. What about quishing? Anybody know what quishing is? So you go to a parking meter and there's a QR code, click, oh, look, there's a site, put in my, my uh, Visa card, good to go. Is that the right site? I don't know, I'm scaring them. You're gonna have a heart. <laughs> How about vishing? This is old tech. Calling up that old voice, hey, I'm a telemarketer, you know. Baiting, just a technique that they're using. Quid pro quo, what's in it for me, it's in it for you. Honey traps, I think the government of Canada is one of the largest honey traps out there, if you will. Scareware, very old school, if you will. They would flash up on your screen, you've been ransomed, you gotta pay this, this, so they were scaring you into paying. This is how they would do it. They'd throw out the bait, they'd hook you, they'd attack you, and then they'd escape. So this is not the fishing story where the fish got away because you're the fish. Some ideas on how to, uh, to help against some of the social engineering, and this is where I think as public servants, doesn't matter what business line you're in, I think we're always going to be vulnerable to some level of an attack just because we're public servants. But the message here that I'm trying to put out there, it's okay, all right? As long as you take a little bit of time to understand what you're doing in what space you're operating in, you'll be fine. Over to you, Nadine. Oh, thank you. Oh, you don't have a slide? Yet. No, I don't have slides. So I'm not sure I'll be able to reassure everyone. Uh, completely, but uh, hello, bonjour. I just wanted to start by acknowledging that I'm joining you today from the unceded territory of the Anishinaabe, and I use the pronoun she, her, elle. So I'm glad to be here today, and especially with the topic of being a shared responsibility for all public servants, whether we're in IT or not in IT. So in terms of landscape, um, the landscape, as you know, has changed significantly over the last five years, I think more specifically, um, more geopolitical conflicts. And uh, what that means also is that there's been more economic sanctions put on countries. So there's a, a financial pressure that needs to be alleviated to continue some state-run programs and cyber is one of the ways to make that gap. Um, you know, we're, we're competing against nations that are uh, recruiting people at 11 years old based on uh, certain aptitudes, so our skill set has to be that much better and we have to keep up to date. Um, as Simon said, I think before a lot of um, the focus was on our infrastructure, it still is, but now there's disruption of service. And as I was mentioning, a lot of financially motivated cyber attacks. So anywhere where there's someone that has, you know, two cents to rub together, there's a threat right there. The US, for example, has seen, and sometimes a threat is not always what you expect it to be. So in the US, before um, the Ukraine conflict uh, started, there was on average about uh, 30, 40 percent of online new creation of new bank accounts that were fraudulent. And the bank system was uh, okay with that because it cost more to kind of tackle the issue. 
just before, as the Ukraine situation worsened, it, that level came up to 95% of online uh, requests for bank accounts were fraudulent. So a lot of banks across the world and American banks kind of closed down the ability to for people to apply for an account online. And that coincided with a lot of Ukrainians trying to push their assets out of the country. So sometimes you don't know the, the actual purpose of the threat or the tactics. According to, um, so I'm, I work in agriculture and agriculture is higher on the radar as a threat as it's ever been because of food insecurity, the role that Canada plays in the world in terms of providing uh, food. And it's very easy with data that's tainted to make our food not, um, to impact import, export of food, for instance. What we've seen also during the pandemic is that Canadians and public servants is that we've relaxed a lot of measures to allow business to continue. And that created a false sense of security. So Gartner 2022 Drivers of Secure Behavior Survey um, found that 69% of employees bypassed security guidance in the last year. So that's quite significant, even with all this threat in the landscape. What's even more challenging, I would say, in the world of cyber is we have a lot of op opposing interest that need to coexist and balance. So the first one, for instance, we need to be as secure as possible, lock everything up, while supporting innovation, transformation, streamlining, being lean. And often some of our security process are seen as an adult, added um, bureaucratic kind of process. The second one I would say is nudging behavior and increasing accountability. We're trying to do that. But often we can't share protected secret information on the threat. So we're not really able to communicate the threat. So how do you make that case convincing that there's an actual threat? The emergence, I think you spoke a bit about on new tech, cloud, AI, it increases risk for sure. But how do you, we can't just not use it because you need to leverage it in the cyber response, because there's no way humans have that kind of computing ability in terms of how much data, the speed, and so on. So how do you leverage it? Behaviors that we're seeing, like from a departmental perspective, is that even though we're doing anti-phishing campaigns, training, communications, we still see software hardware installed without a pro uh, approval, opening emails from unknown sources, sending unencrypted emails with sensitive information, transferring information between work and personal, not using GCSI. I don't know if anybody else here has the challenge to try to push people back because you have to go in person for that. And being in a scientific uh, department, the IOTs, I mean, the proliferation is just um, gone up. So why is that? Well, it takes too long, uh, there's no consequences. And again, it speaks to that false sense of security, I think that we talked about before. So I'll leave it there for now, pass it on to Owen. Okay, thank you, I'm gonna grab the, you guys hear me? There we are. All right, thank you very much. Uh, let me move this forward a little bit. Actually, I'll go back just one. Um, so just a little bit of history uh, for me, just to kind of give some context. I know I'm speaking here on behalf of a vendor, so you're gonna take everything I say with a grain of salt. So I'm trying to give as agnostic uh, an opinion as I can uh, on what we see out there. So my experience in the cybersecurity, data security space, uh, prior to being at Rubrik, was at another data security company for about six years. It was more in the preventive, early detection type phase. And you'll see as I get into the discussion today, um, I think the industry as a whole is starting to move a little bit further downstream to we need to make sure we can actually recover. So there's detective controls that need to be there, but also at the time of an event needing to have some recovery capability. So that's what I'm going to get into a little bit today is some of the industry trends that we see out there. So if you're not familiar with Rubrik, Rubrik uh, is a data, data protection company born in the modern era. Um, so think backup, but it's not 
back up in the traditional sense. And I think that's a, cre- a key thing to take away from today is um, there's a bit of a misconception in the industry that, oh, if there's an attack and they manage to get through all of our defenses, we can just rely on what we have from a backup perspective today to get back online. And that may or may not be true, depending on some of the controls that need to be in place, which I'll, t- I'll touch on. Um, but even once you're in that scenario, the actual recovery process can be very lengthy and challenging for any organization. And a lot of the time is spent sort of assessing how far and why did an attacker get within an environment? What sensitive data did they potentially get access to and exfiltrate? Uh, what reporting do we maybe need to do from that perspective? And really, this is across any industry. And I know from our conversations with many of the departments, you know, some organizations or our departments are moving more towards a cloud-first strategy. So these types of concepts, you know, with the traditional sort of moat and castle approach as we move up into the cloud becomes even more challenging. And so needing to have a recovery plan is particularly important. So what do I mean by that? So today, you know, most of the industry has said, okay, if you are going to be attacked, you have to make sure you have a copy of your data that you can recover from. So let's have an immutable copy. And that could be any number of different ways. It could be if you're dealing with large unstructured data, it's just snapping your NAS and sending it to another copy, putting it to another site, uh, turning on some sort of worm lock or taking a copy and putting it up in the cloud. And those are all viable options to be able to ensure you have access to the data, but then you start to have to deal with challenges around, well, how long will it take to get everything back online? Most of the people I've spoken to today, at minimum, it's the brand reputation of the department. If it was hit and they were down long enough that people noticed and now it becomes publicly known that this particular department was impacted by a potential ransomware or a cyber event. Um, So that's a big part of the conversation and what we're seeing in the industry and this is coming from we actually have a rubric zero lab which is a uh, publishing organization that's an offshoot of our company that also takes feeds from other organizations such as Palo Alto, such as Mandiant and Excel and some others. Uh, and so Mandiant has recently updated their their mean dwell time as being five days here in North America. So attackers are getting in, they're doing their, their best to get to the data as quickly as they can. Uh, and one thing you may not be familiar with is they're actually targeting those backups. So they're identifying weaknesses in the data protection itself so that they're more likely to get paid uh, when they actually exfiltrate that data. And what they're also doing is they're doing double extortion events where they'll attempt to get access to as much sensitive information as they can, because if they can get that out of your environment using some sort of encrypted backdoor, now they have the ability to, even if you don't pay that first ransom to get your decryption key and get all your systems back online, they'll come and extort you and say, well, if you don't pay us, we're going to release this and make it publicly known that we stole this from your department or your organization. Um, So that's becoming a big concern. And generally speaking, the attacks themselves are evolving. So what used to be, well, if we put in, you know, the latest and greatest EDR, we're going to catch it at the guest level as soon as somebody starts to try and encrypt the data. It's actually happening now where they're elevating that towards the hypervisor. They're getting access to the hypervisor layer and they're encrypting the actual VMs themselves. And that's not going to trigger the same types of alerts that you would typically get. So the problem is becoming more pervasive and more challenging to address. So generally speaking, at this point, organizations are having to ask a question if they get hit by an event is where and when do I recover from? I don't have visibility into how this attacker got in my environment. And there was a comment made by Nadine around there's often a bit of a competition. The same kind of scenario happens internally with organizations from their operations team and their security team because security wants to make sure that we've expunge the attackers from our environment before we deem it to be safe, while the operations team is looking to get everything back online quickly. And generally speaking, the challenge then becomes, is the data there in the first place? So I touched a little bit upon that. And it's one of those things that, I mean, the vendors that have been in this space have been in it for years. And I'm not, I'm not saying that they're willfully ignorant in how they do it, but there's a concept of let's bolt on some more security. Let's bolt on some more security. And what ends up happening is that the complexity and the challenge gets pushed down to the organizations that are deploying on ensuring that an attacker, if they manage to get in, if they had access to a privileged account, they couldn't delete the backups. If they had access to the storage layer, they, they could just delete the storage layer. Another um, technique we're seeing in the wild now is we actually have a ransomware response team that works alongside our customers if they have an event, is the attackers will attempt to change the time 
jump the clock 10 years into the future. And now all of the data protection platforms, which are designed to expire data after they've met the retention requirement, will go and delete it. So all of these controls need to be in place to make sure if you have somebody who gets inside your environment, they're not going to be able to delete the backups. But then the next question becomes, if they manage to get past all of the EDR components and, and compromise the, the data, how do we know which machines were included in this particular attack? It's very critical to get that information because as you go through that recovery process, if you don't know, you might just assume it was three weeks ago and then load up a backup from that time period, scan it with some external third-party tools, validate if it was encrypted. If it was, okay, I have to throw that version away and go to the next version and go to the next version. And so there's a lot of time spent what typically is a 21-day recovery cycle, the majority of that is spent just assessing and evaluating how far and wide that particular attack got. Then the next question becomes, what was included in that, that attack? Did they gain access to any sensitive data? Well, if your environment's been encrypted, how do you know what was sensitive and not? You need to have access to that information in real time, and ideally you're proactively reviewing and, and removing access to data that is in an inappropriate location. You know, least, least privilege, all of the new privacy laws are coming in place to say if it shouldn't be there, then, then remove it. So addressing some of those risks proactively, but then the last piece is as you go to do a recovery process, needing to ensure that you're not reintroducing the malware into the environment. We've heard of numerous other customers, well not customers at the time, that went through an iterative process of trying to recover quickly and then just reintroducing the malware back into the environment. So prior to, prior to doing that, having a clear understanding of where and when an attacker got in, and this is where the symbiosis or symbiosis happens between operations and, and security, is security would traditionally want to take an offline version of it, scan it, identify if it was impacted. If you can include that into your data protection platform, the time to detect when the attacker got in, maybe even being proactively notified prior to the uh, ransomware being detonated, that allows for a much faster recovery. So if you know that the attacker was in the environment for five days, but only if these five machines were compromised, the remainder remain just victims of the, of the ransomware encryption event, you can then use that as a data point to do that recovery process. And lastly, uh, ensuring that you're testing this on a regular basis. If you have something that's a bunker in the box and it's often a remote site, how often are you going to reattach that to your network and test what the recovery time would take? And without that information, you can't answer a basic question of, are we safe? Can we get back online? Will it be within you know, less than 24 hours ideally so that this is not making the public news? So I do have some more unabashedly uh, vendor specific content that I'm gonna skip given the nature of the conversation we've had today, but I will jump ahead um, skip all this past all these items and just reference the fact that if you come by our booth upstairs, I'm not sure how many people have been wandering up the halls, you can scan to win a chance for this Marshall uh, amp and we will have a long conversation with you. So please come by. Thank you so much. Thank you. Does it come with a guitar? No, it does not come with guitar or lessons, no. Do we have any immediate questions from the floor? I think there's a raving mic. Looking for a hand. I'll take your. We've got one over here. Yes, sir. You just ask, tell us who you are as well. Okay, my name is uh, Jean Francois. I'm uh, from Health Canada. I was wondering about your thoughts on the convergence of private life and work life in the context of cyber. There's some thoughts about use of uh, yeah. non non so work tools. That speaks directly to one of my slides about how the the, th the landscape is changing. As we introduce Soho, so, so small office, home office, we're using managed service provider router, so not a government sanctioned router. However, we're bringing government sanctioned equipment to that interface or to that uh, ecosystem. That convergence is real. Um, are we in a position where we can strong arm, legislate uh, service providers to set up routers the way we would like them, absolutely not. I mean, they're a service and they provide it to, uh, to citizens uh, of this country. However, I think it goes back to that awareness piece. Uh, as I mentioned, it, it takes maybe 10 minutes to familiarize, familiarize yourself with how your router is actually configured. Small stuff, make sure that the default passwords are not 
set of default passwords. You know, there was top 10 pieces that the Cyber Center push, push, pushes out, if you will, update, patch, like just general cyber hygiene and making sure that you're aware of your own little small office environment will help you mitigate against any potential threat or any uh, attack, if you will. And again, I don't think you're, we're high vis. I don't think we're the main target, if you will. But if you make access easy, they're going to take advantage of it. So why not make it a little harder for them and they can just go to the next person who's got their password set up as password one, two, three or something like that, right? So awareness, you know, take some time, learn about your environment. Uh, if, if policy, if Treasury Board, I shouldn't say that. If policy is dictating MFA, don't moan and groan, just do it, all right? My kids hate it. Dad, why am I getting text message with this code? Just do it. It's the right thing to do. Think back a number of years, and some of you in the crowd can think back when they legalized seatbelts. Everybody was moaning and groaning because they had to put a seatbelt on. Now you just get in the car and you do it, all right? So think that way about cyber. I think it's uh, inevitable that, you know, the two are kind of blurring and I think we've seen it, we'll continue to see it as well. And maybe that's the hook for uh, some of our communications engagement campaign with employees. It's that it's not only skills or tips that you learn for your professional use, but also your personal use. And uh, I had the some of the same thing, I think in terms of you know, good management, whether it's at home or at work, is will help a lot. I mean, your team is there to kind of offer that protection at the GC level, but whether it's a department or your home, I think, you know, MFA for sure, uh, access management, you know, there's a lot of things that we do, but I don't think we do thoroughly or well, like evergreen so that we can keep a certain patching cadence, Onboarding, offboarding, that's always been a challenge. Um, even email labeling, we deployed that in our um, department not too long ago, and there was a lot of grumblings around that extra second to kind of uh, label the information. But again, I think it's we're in a world where we don't have a choice. So sometimes that, that extra little bit of effort can help um, alleviate or prevent a lot of hardship down the road. Yeah, I guess my piece to add would be around, I think as we work more from home, there is a sort of blending of our work and life scenario. This may be less true in some sort of departments and situations as we lock down the systems, but just ensuring that we're just doing good data hygiene. Because if there is a scenario where you've taken a copy of a data that's maybe sitting in SharePoint, but you wanted to manipulate it on your laptop. Now your laptop is a source of potential risk. And so just doing kind of thoughtful things as you're accessing the data and making sure that, you know, to your point, the network at home is safe. But if it isn't, what is the attack surface of my home sort of environment? Thank you. Just want to quickly ask about this sort of the threat landscape and just get a sense of how that's changing. I mean, what, what, what forms of attack are growing fast if the newest so organisations might be less equipped to cope with them at the moment? And who's, who's behind these attacks? Who's the... the, um, the I mean, which, which, which countries' organisations are, are, are... I think we know what countries we're talking about here. Well, we can, we can talk oh, about wait. it then. I, I can give a commercial perspective. Um, so I touched on it briefly. We do have an offshoot of our support organization, which is called the Ransomware Response Team. And they're, on any given week, dealing with one or two customers that are in a large-scale, difficult attack. And for all, by all accounts, uh, every attack is different. Um, but generally speaking, what it involves is somebody managing to get access to somebody's account, some sort of compromise. There was maybe lack of MFA, or they managed to bypass MFA. Um, and once they've gotten inside the environment, it really depends on the, the particular individual. And that's where some of the challenges are in the, in the how do you address it proactively and how do you recover from it? Because they all have different sort of attack techniques that they might be using. Could be vishing, could be phishing, could be any of those other items. Or they might just manage to compromise an account um, that they've got from some other sort of password data dump. Once they're inside the environment, having a zero trust 
sort of concept of not assuming that one person that's within the environment should have elevated rights to make destructive changes is critical. So it's hard to say what's actually taking place. Obviously, there are nation state attacks. There are some very basic ones. The Uber attack that took place not that long ago was a couple of young kids, and they just basically made use of an MFA vulnerability in the, in the human mind and that somebody got tired of having to click no, 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 and they finally clicked yes. You know, it's those kinds of things that are happening. And so it's all about vigilance and being aware of what might potentially be happening around you. I think um, one of the common threat vectors that we're seeing quite a bit of, of past was, um, so a zero day exploitation, right? So this is brand spanking new, nobody knows about it. Threat actors use that to compromise the system. Once that's known, we patch, move on. But you talk about the government canon when there's thousands of endpoints, all right, and you're trying to patch all of those endpoints. There might be one that's on some shooting range up in Petawawa in D&D in a, in a cabin that's running Microsoft Windows 95, all right? And guess what? They'll find it, and then they'll wiggle their way back in. But that's in an extreme case. And why would they do that? Probably preposition. So if you're talking about a state actor, and this is just Simon's opinion here, if you're talking about a state actor, they're probably in it, not to ransom, but in it for the long haul, all right? To, for intellectual property theft, potentially state secrets, call it what you will, but they will spend a lot of time cultivating and grooming said individual, if you will, through social media, through all these techniques that I mentioned up there, to groom them and divulge some level of I don't know, compromise password or whatnot because the individual is might not be quite savvy and they'll leverage that to get in and preposition themselves. Now, if you're talking a conflict, like a force on force, we've seen states actually use cyber um, techniques to deliver an effect in critical infrastructure. We've seen it in the Ukraine and whatnot. Um, but I think from a government of Canada perspective right now, are state actors looking at our networks? 100%. Are we doing a good job at defending them? 100%, all right? I think they're there, we know they're there. Maybe we do, maybe we don't. But I'll leave it at that. Are you seeing the threats against agriculture and agri-food Yeah, well, I think it's, a, it's a, a lot of what's been said, but it's, I think it, the, it, it happens more often than it used to. And it's various degrees. So it could be very slight annoyance, disruptions, but it's like, it's coming at us, I think, from all kinds of angles. So the variety, how often it happens, and the types. You have opportunistic uh, pieces, disruptive, financial. So it, it's, really, um, it's really challenging, I think, right now, for sure. Questions over here, sir. Yeah, hi. I, I um, was mentioned various times. My name is Lloyd Brady from uh, Shared Services Canada. Uh, ransomware was mentioned several times, right? Would it be possible to give maybe a brief uh, explanation of how exactly a ransomware attack is effective? Because, I mean, essentially, I, I don't know, is it somebody opens an email, opens some script, and somehow it leads to access to the actual backend server to do this encryption. I, I'm just trying to understand the, the attack chain there, right? How, how do you get from, you know, uh, 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 yeah, a user maybe doing an incorrect action to exposure of the backend system? Thank you so much. It's a good question. You're putting me on the spot here. Oh, and you might have to back me up on this one. So there, there's a whole ecosystem out there uh, that rats are, that cyber criminals use. They don't necessarily own the whole attack chain themselves. They might have a broker that, that sells access to a specific compromised device. Once they've sold that access, the threat actor will get onto that access. They will either ransom or they will contract somebody and like it's called um, ransomware as a service. They will actually get somebody to, to compromise the box, set the monetary amount. If it's paid, they will go to a financial broker. So that whole ecosystem is not just one individual coming into your computer, taking what they want, getting payment and getting out. There's a number of players in there, so it's, it's very challenging to track down 
where on what the, the, the threat actor is using because you get into tumblers and how they distribute the Bitcoin like it's spitting out many shoots. So you're trying to track all these coins and trying to funnel it in. Now we've had success, not we, the government has had success, if you will, at tracking these down. Uh, but it's a very challenging piece. And typically it goes back to somebody's account got compromised where they've gone to a what they thought was a great site that looked just like the site that they wanted, inputted their credentials, and guess what? Their password that they used to get into that site is also their password for their, you know, their low side GC account, their high side account, because it just, it's crazy. And just on, in terms yeah. of, uh, the gentleman's asking, you know, what, what's, what's the, the point at which your, your security is breached? And as I understand it, it's, you know, if you click on the link, yep. if you open an attachment, if you input data somewhere, are they the key ones? Yeah, those are the key ones. Did you want to add That's them? Right. Yeah, and I think some of the examples of the more specific items that might take place is once one of those accounts has been, has been compromised, it might potentially be used to laterally move around and maybe even just look at what that particular account has access to, whether it's on an internal file share or it's on SharePoint or something like that. And then they could potentially make an attack just based on that, because most users have read-write capabilities. If they can change the contents of the file, then they can actually apply that encryption, which will use a, a key to encrypt that file. And so the only way to get it back is to obviously use that encryption key. That's typically speaking more of the sort of ransomware as a service type uh, example that was provided, because it's a little bit more opportunistic and smash and grab. Uh, what you'll find with a lot of the more sophisticated attacks and you know professional ransomware gangs and, and the more nation state would be the identifying more sort of weak targets within the environment, um, spending that time exfiltrating it, uh, and then making it unavailable. Um, and that would typically be, you know, deleting the backups, deleting the actual content, going through an encryption event on the content. Uh, and that could be using things like an exploit of VMware, for example. There was a very public notification not that long ago of a number of users or companies, the number of companies out there that were still using very, very old code. Well, if you're not keeping your systems up to date, as it was mentioned, and patching them regularly, then those, those exploits become easily um, utilized. And the gangs will actually make it be so it's very repeatable. It's not just very specific to one customer. If they can have that one flaw, that one compromise, they'll then use that on a number. So if they manage to get in and just encrypt all of your, your virtual environment, well, obviously now you're stuck. You might have your Active Directory running on there. You might have some of your security tools running on there. You might even have your, your defense components uh, on there in some way. So now you're really, really challenged with, with getting it back online. I hope that answered the question. So we've, sorry, just to add on that. So we've, uh, Cyber Center is kind of using what we're calling Cyber Operation Kill Chain. So you've heard of the MITRE attack. Very long, lengthy, super busy, but great information. There's really mainly four or five stages. There's the reconnaissance stage where they're cultivating, they're grooming, they're looking for information, social media, what's going on in the news. The staging, so they've just bought access, if you will. The actual actions on when they've done the ransom or they've ex exfilled data, and then psh, out they go. All right. Sorry. Another question over here. Um, it's Charlie Floriano from the Ontario Energy Board. I'm, I'm on the IT side of things, and uh, my question is kind of to your topic: uh, task for every public servant. Um, my experience finds that uh, a lot of times non-IT folks see. Uh, that task being IT's responsibility, not necessarily the broader uh, organization. So I'm wondering, how, how do we change that? How do we uh, you know, make it every, every public servant's responsibility? So Any thoughts around that? Particularly a challenge because you, you, know, you need people to own it. You need a sense of accountability amongst individuals. But actually, you also want people to be honest about when stuff's gone wrong. And you can't be just like punish the, the confessor because people then don't confess. Um, what do you think, Sam? Or yeah, Nadine? So I guess it's a little bit like, you know, going to your physician and he tells you everything you need to do in order to stay healthy and you do some of it, you don't do other stuff. I think it's making it relevant to the different audiences. So, for instance, I think it's worthwhile. It's Cyber is a multidisciplinary discipline uh, aspect. So go to your, I think I would say, go work with your comms group and look at it, not just from the regulatory 
perspective, but what's the human risk behavior in that type of business? So when you engage with the client, you make it a little bit more relevant to themselves and target your messages accordingly. Um, we've we started to look at our anti uh, phishing campaign and so on, and looking at the data, and maybe going to the individuals that you know need a little bit of extra help, and then also recognizing the ones that are doing really well. Um, I think also sharing information. Sometimes it's not just every employee. You know, our management teams too, making them more aware, maybe bringing forward some uh, secret, top secret um, debriefs so that they're more sensitized, aware of these things. And then uh, working with HR, security, um, there's not, still it, it's, it's the accountability, right? So I think it, it, we need to work in partnership with other areas within uh, each department or different lines of business, um, not just IT for the sake of IT or within IT itself. Thank you. Yeah, I, that's a great question because you've got your IT specialists that want to deliver a service. They want the user experience to be good, no complaints. And then you've got the cybersecurity specialist that is imposing a whole pile of stuff saying, no, you got to do this, making the ex user experience not so good and problematic and cumbersome. So there, you know, we, we say it in the IT OT, so operational technology, there's a convergence here. I think there's something similar happening here. You're going to see IT and cybersecurity converge if there are not, if they haven't already. And you're going to have, like I mentioned then before, where cybersecurity is just, is, just common practice. It's going to become the, the, the reoccurring theme, if you will. So there's that convergence happening. It's a challenge now because you've probably still, I, I know I have it in, in my shop, I've got the on-prem folks and I've got the cloud folks and it's like fire and ice between them, you know? Woof. So you've probably got the IT folks, you've got the cybersecurity folks, but at some point we need to build bridges and make sure that we can just make it better for, for all of us. I mean, where, where have you seen organizations actually succeed in getting their employees, whether public, private, or voluntary sector, to really own this? And how do they go about doing it? That's an interesting question. So, I mean, I would say we spend a lot of time behind the scenes. So the end users wouldn't necessarily see our solutions in place. But I think it does bring up the you know point of needing to have less friction for the end users in their sort of day-to-day -day operations as well as less friction between security and operations teams. And the more that that can be converged and addressed on the back end, obviously the easier it'll be from an end user perspective. So having the ability to get visibility across not just siloed workloads, that is part of the challenge today is there's a lot of technologies out there that are very, very bespoke, sort of purposeful for that particular technology, but then that same methodology or concept doesn't apply to say cloud. Um, and so adopting technologies sort of on the services and security side that are designed to communicate together. And so that way operational people can be made aware of security risks and vice versa more quickly. And oftentimes when you're in some sort of a crisis, it doesn't matter what your hat is that you're wearing. You're all hands on deck trying to get the systems back online. So the more you can collaborate up front, the easier it'll be in those types of sort of real world damaging situations. Yeah, I just wanted to add, so I have five teams, three of them are cyber, transformation, and operations. So what I do is normally I have a meeting with the three directors and their team once a month, just to gain better awareness and understanding, because often it's the way we speak about each other to clients. So trying to say, okay, we're all on the same team, how do we tackle this one? And then those discussions often there's, because you talked about the friction, and I think it's important if we have cyber um, measures in place that aren't really yielding the results, like we don't need to keep doing those plus doing a bunch of other ones. So just regularly, you know, uh, questioning that is, is healthy as well. Thank you. We're really down to the sort of last two minutes, but uh, there's this, this gentleman got a break. <laughs> I didn't want to jump on yours, but I'll make it quick. Uh, further to what Wally said, we agree. But how do we make progress? And I'm, I'm sure at your level, you're talking to the chair or president or 
CFOs in order to get the money part, but down to, let's say, on middle management level, to convincing as an expense, cybersecurity and expense, and bad guy only have to, you know, good once. We have to be there 100% of the time. And then we're fighting, not fighting, but, you know, trying to convince the IT, the dev guy who's making money for the company because we're an expense, and at the same time, a normal a regular average employee who at times will send an email to work email under the thing, hey, aren't we safe here? So I can open and click here and you guys got my back. And it's just my cat pictures in there. So. <laughs> You want to, is I, that a question? I love this question. <laughs> so I think at the last panel, I don't know if you were here for the last panel, some of the gentlemen said, you know, a story, a bad story is really going to paint the picture. And often or not, sometimes it takes something not so desirable to happen to prove a point. But mind you, we've seen a lot of undesirable situations now. And I think the point has been proven that cyber is real. And we need to take, we need to bring security to the forefront, if you will. So I've always told my team, if we really want to sell that cybersecurity asset, you got to tell a good story uh, at the end of the day. Did you want to add to that? Yeah, I would say uh, the preparedness piece. So the, the, the analogy you made of it only takes one a positive attempt for them to get in you have to assume that that's going to happen. So the idea is, if you notice that you have access to data, you shouldn't flag it, make people aware. That shouldn't be there, we should be reducing that. If it's happening to you, it's probably happening to other people. Um, and just having some context and awareness that if my account was compromised, what would be the potential impact on that? And if you know that maybe I have access to old systems, people change jobs within the same organization, they maintain access to data they probably shouldn't have access to. Having a little bit of diligence on that aspect, because really at the end of the day, it's, it's having that zero trust mindset of if something were to happen, let's limit the potential scope of that. So the, the way that I position it when I do the pitch to get you know, dollars for cyber, for sure. Like it's always easier when it's an innovation, transformation, hot topic and so on. But because I have a little bit of both, I kind of position it more in terms of, you know, you have your regular uh, budget, you have a portion of it that it's expense and a portion of it that's your investment for the long term. So the way I see it is I cyber is more that investment for the long term so that we keep going. So we have a proportion of um, all the money that we that comes from TB sub that goes to some of these longer term investments. So I guess it's making the case that it's not just for now; it's for now and then moving forward as well. I mean, the quote you use is actually almost exactly what the IRA said to Margaret Thatcher in the 1980s. They said, "You know, you have to be successful all the time. We only need to be succeed once, and then." They, they blew up the hotel in Brighton where the Tories were holding party conference that year. And they were right. But actually, you know, no hotels have blown up since because people did learn the lesson and improve security. And there's been plenty of Brighton bombings across the public sector and across the world now that people can point to and say to the finance directors, you know, this is a very real risk. And, you know, the scale that there might be a relatively small chance, but the scale of the problem caused if they succeed is enormous and it needs investment. And on that note, we've run out of time. So thank you all for coming. I'd ask you to thank our panel. Thank you.